everybody, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Wendy Lee, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight to what it all means. Joining us today is Dennis Zen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. It's Friday. Surprisingly, we don't have any Transformers news for what you the? today. Yeah. I'm, off. Yeah, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Also here today, Perry Nemiroff. No Transformers, but we have what matters, Jurassic World. Sorry, Roka, not really. <laughs> And the outlaw himself, John Roca. Yeah, what's really important is there's no Pacific Rim stories. That's really what's important <laughs> here. I'm wearing my vision shirt. Let's make some things happen. Let's get it on. And sipping something green from his cup, Mark Ellis. Uh, yeah, this is a lot of strong <laughs> ginger in this. I did not expect that amount of ginger in this, but I'll drink it for you, the home viewer. <laughs> All right, uh, before we get started for our first news topic, we actually kind of got an an announcement slash, I don't know, almost like a warning for something that's coming Whoa. on Monday. We're bringing Christian Harloff here to what are you tell us about, a little Dennis? about, about, what are you about it. Talking about? What are you oh, oh, okay. hi, Mark. <laughs> um, all right, so I just want, hey, I like my shirt. That's great. So <laughs> I just want to let you guys know, because yep. I told John I would do this. Um, John who? He, stop talking. Okay, all right. So here's the thing. So John and Campy and, uh, and myself, we were in a meeting, and these characters came in who you guys would... They're interesting. Uh, one of the guys, all I can say, his name is Captain Learning, and they're like these three kind of renegade uh, bloggers or vloggers, and they pitch something that they want to put on the channel. Uh, John and I were like, I don't know if that's right for the channel, but nepotism, she a bitch. Um, so it's going to happen on Monday. Be on the lookout for Captain Learning, apparently, um, and uh, I want to know what the hell you guys think about this. It happens on Monday. It's called Captain Learning. It's something. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. All right, now back to our regularly scheduled program. When do we get up first? Well, how do you follow that? All right, so we're going to classify this as a rumor for now, albeit a rumor that makes a lot of sense. Our friends over at Screen Junkies are reporting that Back to the Future director Robert Zemeckis is in talks for DC's The Flash. After losing two previous directors in Seth Graham Smith and Dope's Rick Famuyiwa, no news has surfaced about a possible replacement until now. At the same time, Umberto Gonzalez of The Rap did confirm Zemeckis as having met on the project, but that he is not in talks and that DC is still meeting with other directors. Dennis, thoughts on Robert Zemeckis led The Flash movie? Yeah, so it's unclear whether he just had a meeting or if he's actually in talks. Either way, it's an interesting name that came out of left field. I didn't yeah. expect it at all. But then when you kind of think about it, like, hmm, what has Zemeckis directed before that involved a young man with multiple, <laughs> with multiple timelines, you know? <laughs> so, you know what? I It actually, if, if it develops further and they actually go through with this, I, I actually think it's a good fit. I mean, Zemeckis, is, he's done so many great films over the years. You know, uh, what was his last film? Allied came out. It didn't mm -hmm. do that well at the box mm -hmm. office, but I, I quite enjoyed mm -hmm. it. Uh, Perry, what do you think? Uh, well, there are no negotiations here, and there's no there's no one saying whether or not Zemeckis even wants to do this. I mean, people take meetings all the time just as, as favors, and for whatever reason, he's probably just sat down and had a chat about it, so this might mean nothing at all, so no one get crazy about this just yet. But if it does wind up panning out that... Robert Zemeckis is directing the Flash movie. I'll certainly be happy about it. I've liked a lot of his recent films. I think Allied deserved a little more credit than it got. And the same thing with The Walk, too. I thought The Walk was mm. really good. And, you know, no one really saw that, whatever September that came out in, and it made, like, no money. And mm. I feel like nobody got the credit they deserved for that movie. But it'd be interesting to see what a Flash movie directed by him would look like. Clearly, the DCEU is gobbling up like every big name director they can get right now. I mean, I was just making a list of all these great people. Patty Jenkins, James Wan, Matt Reeves, possibly Joss Whedon, and then the talks about Mel Gibson. Clearly, they are shooting super high with the directors they want to attach to this franchise, and that can only be a good thing. Mm. Else? Uh, you know, Dennis, I'd be very excited if Robert Zemeckis joined the long list of directors that at one point were signed on to do The Flash and then dropped out three <laughs> weeks later. Look, I don't know that this is going to happen, and I love Robert Zemeckis as a director, like you alluded to. Back to the Future might be the greatest movie of all time that takes place on planet Earth. Have 
having said that, and look, I love Forrest Gump, but I thought Flight was really good too. I just, I, I prefer when studios that are making comic book movies go after younger, more hungry talent that have a storytelling basis in smaller movies and give them a platform to expand their own brand and also expand the universe that they're trying to create. Zemeckis, I have no problem. I'd be cool with that guy making a Flash movie. I just prefer to see somebody else who maybe I haven't heard of yet because DC, I like Perry said, they're going for stars. They're going for name brand talent. I don't always think that's the best fit when you're trying to put together a cinematic universe. I'd rather have somebody who's a little more unknown. Rucka. Yeah, this is an interesting topic, right? You you bring up a great point. Back to the Future stuff is great. You uh, Perry as well. You spoke about his other movies. And, and Ellis, you make a great point about him being a bit out, along in the tooth. You know, when he did Back to the Future, he's a young man doing Back to the Future. There's something about it. When directors get older, they explore these other themes. You know, like we saw in Flight, like we saw in Progressively and Castaway. The thing about Zemeckis, though, and this is something that you have to say, is he's able to walk into multiple genres and succeed in them. Death Becomes Her is one of these quietly awesome comedies that he knows how to walk that line of like serious subjects with the kind of smirking comedy that you can put in there. Romancing the Stone is a great film as well that he was a part of. Uh, and so so these things that he's done through his life and flight flight is fantastic mm -hmm. so he can explore the darker themes that we see coming through with Zack Snyder in the DCE universe that they're trying to create with these movies my concern is 100% what Ellis said is that he's a little too long in the tooth to do a young man's young man's version of Flash and I think they have to find these young because the people you listed most of them are younger people who are grabbing on because they understand what the that demographic wants to see and I think if you're doing an older Flash if you're doing Spider-Man Rain if you're doing Batman Dark Knight Returns, you can get an older director because they understand those themes. You're not going to have a 30-year-old directing a 55-year-old theme. Like It's just really difficult to understand that intrinsically, not only just from the script, but also the director getting the mood and the atmosphere of that film correct so that people gravitate to it and understand it. See, with me, it's it's not that he's too old. I mean, I like hanging out with older people. You and I are going to the movies later today. <laughs> That's I'm what's just, right. I'm just <laughs> younger people. It's, it, it's more that, that I want somebody who has a, not less experience, just somebody who, like, when you took somebody like like the Russo brothers and, and you grabbed them from community and you're like, oh, I, I think you guys are ready to try this. I want somebody who's been incubating for a minute, who's made a couple smaller movies. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of style that I like seeing, giving yeah. a shot on the big platform where Robert Zemeckis has his choice of projects and he's had his choice of projects for 25 years. I'd rather see somebody new get a shot. Yeah, and I'd like to see Zemeckis keep exploring this, uh, these darker, older, mature themes in his movies. Like, he's doing great work with this stuff, like sure. you said. Allied was good. I actually was surprised how good I enjoyed, how much I enjoyed that movie. So let him keep going down that path. But I mean, either to, way, you need somebody him. with a sense of humor that's going to yeah. be able to get this character. Yeah. Yeah. All right, what's next? In an interview with the Toronto Sun about his upcoming Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, director James Gunn revealed that he and Marvel Super Chief Kevin Feige have plans for Sylvester Stallone that will go beyond his appearance in Volume 2. <laughs> We won't spoil his part. For that, you'll have to see the movie. Though Gunn isn't clear about where Sly will show up next, he teased big things for the actor. My plan is to see more of Stallone's character. I'm not sure about him appearing in Volume 3. We'll have to see about that. But it's our plan to see more of Stallone. Kevin and I are working on what is going to become the Marvel Cosmic Universe and where it's going to go. It's my plan to have Sly, and I talked to him last night, to find a place for him in the future of the Marvel Universe. Mark, thoughts on the future of Marvel Cinematic Universe, including Sylvester Sloan? Wendy, there's a lot of spoiler alerts going off in my mind right now, so I have to talk very carefully about this, because I have seen Guardians Volume 2, and Wendy's right, you don't get a whole lot of Sylvester Stallone in that film, so if you're going to see Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, and you're expecting a sequel to tango and cash it's not gonna happen as much as we all want to see that sequel it didn't happen in the movie coming out this friday but i would like to see more of stallone's character because the i guess the rest of his storyline or the brief storyline that we get to see in volume two i think there's a lot more to explore there so i don't need a standalone movie about his character but i think going forward in the universe i think there's other things that we can do and stallone is always a credit to any project he's in so what, what you, if you're asking me if i want to see more sly i want to see more sly in every movie let's have it Rucka. Well, as a person on the panel who hasn't seen it, uh, I'm excited to see what his part is going to be. So if you're asking me, do I want Sliced Alone in more Marvel films? Yes, absolutely. I absolutely buy this. I think it's a great idea. Well, I know what I sell or buy, but I'm saying I absolutely <laughs> like this idea. I want I want this to happen. I'm excited to see what he what does in the movie. Like I, I already got my tickets. May 5th, I'm going to be there to watch it. Um, so you're asking me, do I want him more? Yeah, because I think he brings the... He has the right sensibility for the Marvel uni film universe, right? He's got that. He can be tough. 
tough and he can be in action when he needs to be, but he can also make those little commas, little jokes. Like that's how he made his living in the eighties. Just Ma- say it. I know you want to say the word. What's that? I know I can see that look in your eyes. Listen, listen. Let, Stallone, the, let the people at home play no, the drinking no, game. No, Stallone in a Marvel universe. What's the word? That's not Adrian? the word. Gravi- What's the word? He does it's not he does not bring gravitas to <laughs> <laughs> Everyone take a shot. It's not a serious, you know, these are these are these are not the things you're doing in these films. I'm sure he's not doing that in Guardians. I mean, he's perfect for a Guardians universe, right? Because they make those cracks, they make those comments. I mean, the whole Guardians thing, they have that vibe from the old 80s action action comedy films of him and and Schwarzenegger. So to me, I I'm super happy to see him more and more in the Marvel universe. And if he ends up in Indies, if he ends up in Infinity War or any of the Avengers films, God, that'd be awesome. Perry. I'm Envious of you, Ellis. You're so good at talking around spoilers. Yeah. Where like there was another recent Marvel story or something where I had seen a movie early and I didn't want to spoil anything, <laughs> so I just I, like I talked myself in circles and everyone's like, "Oh, she just doesn't doesn't know anything about that character." I'm like, "No, I actually know stuff, and I shouldn't say it." Which is the same thing in this case. But given what I saw of Sylvester Stallone in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two, I want more of that character. Uh, I'm interested in seeing him. I mean, it is hard when you see him on screen to not think of him as just Sylvester Stallone Mm -hmm. instead of a character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I think it's good as long as he is, let's say, in Guardians 3, Infinity War, maybe Thor, some other of the cosmic uh, universe stuff. But I don't want to see it like a spinoff with him. Mm -hmm. I don't want a whole film to be a standalone based on on his character. It would have been good if they were still doing those one shots. Yeah, yeah, you're talking about the ones on the Blu-rays yeah, and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, but I don't think for the price that Stallone commands, I don't think he, I doubt he's going to yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah, those are usually those ancillary characters, you know, they're, uh, that that you don't get to see that much of. And just for the record, the best Stallone comedy is uh, uh Stop or my mom will shoot. No, Oscar. Really? No. Stop over, or my mom will shoot. Over the top, over the top had some good chuckles in it. Will ya? But there's chuckles in every one of his films. Even the Rocky films have a little comedy. Yeah, I'd have to go with Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these are not good movies we're debating no. right now. All these movies you can find in the two ninety nine aisle in your bargain bin. But Tango DVD. and Cash, he has comedy in Tango and Cash. Yeah, that's more yeah. of like an ac- action Yeah, film. but that's what I'm saying. He this is not a joke. I was on a plane of. yesterday flying back here in American Airlines. They have Tango and Cash under comedy. Nice. Yes, yeah. you can watch Tango it and Cash on an airplane. <laughs> nice. Demolition Man's funny. Yeah. All yeah. Right. <laughs> All right, guys. Now we're moving on to buy or sell. Wendy, what do we got first? The first one, um, talking about Deadline, reporting that Universal Pictures has attached Kevin Hart to start in The Great Outdoors, a reboot the studio is developing based on the 1988 John Hughes scripted film that starred John Candy and Dan Aykroyd. Randall Green is writing the new version of the movie with the social network and Fifty Shades of Grey producer Michael DeLuca producing. The original star Candy as a Chicago man eager to enjoy a camping vacation with his family, only for his brother-in-law, played by Ackroyd, to crash the event. No word on a director or release date at this time. Rogue up by or sell Kevin Hart in a great outdoors remake. I'm going to echo the movie trivia schmodown champion Mark Riley and say, do we really need a great outdoors (laughs) remake? It just doesn't make any sense. And I'll be honest with you, it's not one of my favorite John Candy films. I think it's one of his lesser offerings. And I think it's not because of him. I think Aykroyd is kind of doing, he's working out his Caddyshack 2 thing in this film, (gasps) which bothers me a little bit. And I think this is an interesting move for Kevin Hart because you're coming off of Central Intelligence, which is arguably your most popular Film in the mainstream. Yes, I know Ride Along and Ride Along got a sequel, but you're, I, I know you're, the hard, you're one of the hardest working actors in the business. You got Google money, so you don't have to work if you don't want to. You were smart in investing early. But my situation with this is this Kevin, you're not, you don't have to do this. Like, you don't have to do these kinds of movies anymore. Like, move a little. This is Ice Cube territory. You're not in Ice Cube territory. And there's nothing wrong with Ice Cube. I love when he pops up in 21 Jump Street and all these other films, but his lead films don't make that much money and they're not that good. So, to me, for Kevin, I want Kevin to do something. Start Move, like use the central intelligence as a stepping stone to get to other things like move away from Wedding Ringer and all these other kind of like smaller comedies right that's my personal belief but the truth is African Americans in uh, Hollywood have to grab what they can grab because there's not a lot of opportunities to be leads in films and so you take it you take what you can get you cash that check you make that money and you move on to your next project so I respect it in that vein I just was I just would hope for him to do some more a uh, higher concept fairs for lack of a better term so that he can keep establishing himself because I enjoy him on screen I think he's funny I think he's a decent actor in, in dramatic moments as well and I really enjoy Central Intelligence so for me this seems like a step back for his career instead of a step forward Perry 
Yeah, I'm going to sell it right now. Uh, I've seen The Great Outdoors once. It never really hit me enough to yeah. want to watch it again. My John Candy movie will always be Cool Runnings, but ah, I, I really oh, yeah. I love Cool Runnings yeah. too much. Um, I don't think it's a, a case of, you know, Kevin Hart having to grab every opportunity he can possibly get his hands on. I mean, that guy made his career what it is. He mm. has earned every opportunity yeah. he gets, and I'm sure he has tons of offers to do almost whatever he wants, where he could be in a position where he just comes up with a great idea and says, I want to make this movie, and I bet you he can get the money and the people to actually make that happen, sure. which is why this saddens me a little, because I love Central Intelligence. Yeah. I like I like when a role is kind of made for him and there's nothing to say that they can't manipulate this original story in a way that better suits him as an actor and better suits whoever else they cast alongside him so for all we know they could change the original quite a bit and it could have some little original <coughs> nugget to it that'll make me more excited but when you just say a remake of this movie with Kevin Hart I'm not interested mm. Yeah, I'm going to buy it. I mean, I haven't seen Great Outdoors in a long, long time, but I think the premise suits Kevin Hart well. The question is, is he going to play the John Candy character or the Dan Aykroyd character? I think oh. it, I think if they're, they're leading off with him, maybe he is the John Candy character. He's the mm. guy that's going on vacation with his kids. Hey, you guys talk about Central Intelligence. The chemistry he had with The Rock, could The Rock play his brother-in-law? <laughs> oh. show Like, I'd buy that. Then like, I'm in. The, yeah. the Rock shows up. He's the guy who's messing about right. and, and causing him a lot of problems, which he did very well in Central Intelligence. Mark? Uh, well, I mean, The Great Outdoors is a funny movie. It's no Oscar, but it's a really <laughs> funny movie. I still would be up for this. I'm buying this because The Great Outdoors, while it is a funny film, it's not anything that is like legendary comedy status. It's not untouchable gold to me, and there's no Great Outdoors canon that I'm worried about. You don't actually have to have like the John Candy character or the Dan Aykroyd character. You can simply take the premise of families going on vacation and having some conflict in the wilderness, and I think it's going to work with Kevin Hart's character because he's really fun when he's put in awkward situations such as camping and then having some overbearing friend that's always you know trying to invade his privacy or his families or annoying him so if you have him even him and ice cube i'd much rather see them in this together mm. than have ice cube do like ride along part seven yeah. i think that's a better fit so really the question here is whether the public still has an appetite for another kevin hart movie because the guy even before he was a movie star when he was a comic he's got one of the best work ethics i've ever yeah. seen he never wants to stop working which is is a huge credit to him so i'd like to see him continue to do movies like this but to echo roca's point look at john candy and look at what john candy was able to do in his career he was one of the funniest humans on the planet but when you watch planes trains and automobiles yeah. the best parts about those movies to me is when he's being dramatic because he was one of the best actors working mm -hmm. bar none i think kevin hart has that in him i'd like to eventually see him explore that side but in the meantime i'd be up for a great outdoors remake starring him yeah. all right what's next in a new interview on Larry King Now, Jurassic World 2 star James Cromwell has revealed how his character in the new film is connected to the original Jurassic Park movie. Director J.A. Bayona looks to continue Trevorrow's relaunch of the franchise, and following the announcement that Jeff Goldblum has signed on to reprise his role as Ian Malcolm, it appears that the sequel will have heavy ties to the movie that started it all. Speaking about his character, Cromwell said, The character Richard Attenborough played, I'm his partner, Benjamin Lockwood. We've developed the technology of being able to clone the genes and so I'm trying to deal with the blowback from what we have done. Perry, buy or sell Cromwell's character and connections from Jurassic Park. Hurts. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> I, I have to sell this. And I'm, I'm not going to go as far to say I don't like this idea for this character. And that's going to make Jurassic World 2 a terrible movie. There are so many good things that that movie has going for it, especially Bayona as a director. It's just this, to me, makes no sense at all. And I, I really don't like the idea especially after having seen Independence Day Resurgence, where that wasn't a good movie overall, but one of my biggest problems with that is that certain things happen in that movie where now when I go back and I watch the first one, I gotta rethink who certain people are, knowing what happens to them. And this is a similar thing, where now, because I know that this character is going to exist in Jurassic World 2, I don't know if I'll be able to go back and watch all the original movies without wondering, well, where was this guy? What was he up to? Again, for all I know, when we see the full feature, they're going to have a great reason for why he wasn't around and his name was never mentioned. But right now, this sounds a little weird to me. I'm going to buy it. I know it's a retcon. They're, they're doing, I have a feeling they're doing it because Richard Attenborough is, is 90 years old and they're not going to be able to get him into this. And they wanted that type of character to come in that like helped create this technology and then has some sort of guilt 
towards it, and I, I hope they don't turn him into some sort of black and white villain, and they they actually explore that part of his character. And, and James Cromwell, ever since you know L.A. Confidential, for me, yeah, he, yeah, I, I think he fits this role really well. Roca, yeah, uh, well, he's, I buy it. I buy it. Uh, Edinburgh's dead, I think. He died in 2014, I think. Did he? I yeah. think. From what I'm looking at Wikipedia, it says yeah. uh -huh. it says August 24th, 2014. Okay. So they obviously can't bring him back. But I think their premise to bring him is to bring the idea of an older guy who was part of this process. Who was the, So they're basically trying to evoke the Attenborough spirit by having James Cromwell step in for it. So I get the logic of it. I do buy the logic of it because you kind of have to almost create a villain. And Cromwell plays great villains when he does it. I mean, he might be the villain of the well, movie. Well, we don't. That's the thing is we yeah. don't know and that's that's really the only thing that makes this character somewhat interesting yeah, is right. the whole idea that this movie is going to be about dino rights and yeah. if he was involved with this whole creation process to begin with what side of that line is he going to fall on yeah and that's why i'm buying it uh, so yeah with perry saying, <laughs> <laughs> like i said <laughs> I, was, I was gonna make that point but i perry thank you um yeah but that's the thing i don't you don't know what's in cromwell is so great at playing both villains and good guys like we saw in babe so i think he's the great choice for this because what, what's his face uh um uh, bd wong was kind of a villain in in jurassic world so you're having him come back this makes sense the fact that he's admitting that he's part of this process and sometimes we hear about this all the time like people who two people who could create well there's a silent partner and the face partner right you know this what happens most of the time like we just saw the waffle house the two guys just died within three weeks of each other yesterday so it's just really interesting these things that happen so it could work yeah it, it happened so it could work and i and i think this is another way for them to open the door to sam neil and laura dern coming back too because it may just be this connection too so you're going to bring everybody back eventually from the original first film which i think would be great and i would like to see that happen i love the goldblums coming back you know you brought up babe i buy a shared universe where james cromo is a farmer <laughs> growing talking pigs and the talking pigs have to fight the dinosaurs let's make that movie in the meantime uh yeah i i'll I, I get nervous because what bugged me about jurassic world was that they made bd wong's character this like evil kind of yeah. conniving sneaky guy and he, he wasn't that guy in the first one he was just he was just a scientist hired by you know the the richard attenborough character so i i it, it makes me a little nervous that they're doing this i'm gonna buy it though because i like james cromwell mm. as an actor i think he him and charles dance both have that ability to yeah. be like either like really good you know patriarch figures or they can be a little conniving a little weasley a little evil even so james cromwell was that to richard attenborough's character because look when you meet him in jurassic park you're like this guy this guy figured out how to get dna out of mosquitoes or did he have other people helping him so he i'm sure he had other people helping him. are we sure that benjamin lockwood the name was never mentioned in the movies yeah. or the novels the people who've read the novels no no. It was never mentioned. Never mentioned. Okay. You, I mean, you guys all had me second guessing myself because I know that movie word for word with books, mm -hmm. there's a lot more words in books. You know, Ellis, right? Oh, no, you don't. Too many. <laughs> oh. Too, many. Too many words. But, you know, in, in that book, a big thing is, you know, InGen versus Biosyn, and there's a whole bunch of people in charge, important names. And, you know, for all I know, in my five, six, seven readings of it, I could have missed someone like lurking in the background or or that one time where John Hammond was like, oh yeah, like my, my partner in the background that you guys yeah. don't know about, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure that this character does not exist. <laughs> All right, uh, what's next? It was recently announced by Dwayne The Rock Johnson that after he films Rampage and Skyscraper, his next two projects, he'll finally tackle the long-development Jungle Cruise movie for Disney. No other actor has been announced, and no director is currently attached to the script by the crazy, stupid love duo of Glenn Ficarra and John Racroix. However, The Rock does have a short list of directors he'd like to work with, and Wonder Woman helmer Patty Jenkins is at the top. In a profile about the Wonder Woman director done by AP, Johnson had this to say about Jenkins directing Jungle Cruise. Patty has that really cool edge. I felt like she could be a really cool choice for a movie like Jungle Cruise, Johnson said. Plus, you know what? I'm just a big fan. Dennis, buy or sell Patty Jenkins directing Jungle Cruise with The Rock. I'll buy it for now. I mean, my enthusiasm will go up and down whether or not how <laughs> much I like Wonder Woman. I do find it interesting. You have The Rock who plays Black Adam. You have uh, uh, Patty Jenkins who's directing Wonder Woman in the, in the Warner Brothers DC camp, but then Jungle Cruise is a Disney property. They're both coming over there. You have Joss Whedon, who directed Avengers, now doing Batgirl, probably. You have Josh Brolin, who is is Thanos, that's going to play Cable. That, that's why it just goes to show you, like, with, with this whole fanboyism of, like, I'm a Marvel fanboy or I'm a DC fanboy. or These actors don't care. 
they're, they're, they're doing a job. They're, they, they care about money. They care about, you know, what role they're going to play. So all that other stuff is kind of nonsense. Broca? Yeah, yeah I, I like this idea. And, Janice, you, you bring up a great point. I mean, this makes sense. We're a month out of Wonder Woman. Rock is going to p- play Black Adam. So he it's, it's synergy. It's you promote the person. I mean, it makes sense. And I know his feelings are genuine for Patty Jenkins. Absolutely. And I think it's a good thing that he's championing a female director for this. It does not happen often. So this is a good thing all around. And I think she might... It's just interesting if she couldn't do this. Because, I mean, Monster and, and nothing about her resume necessarily speaks to her ability to direct lighthearted, fun, adventure comedy. <laughs> so to me, it would be an interesting thing for her to take on. I'm sure the paycheck will be great. Um, and I think depending on what you said, depending on what happens in Wonder Woman, we'll get an idea of her ability to do comedy with an action. Because that film in the trailers, it really feels like there's a lot of lighthearted comedy in certain moments that we're missing in other of the other DCEU films. And so if she can walk that line effectively in this movie, then I think it's almost like, why wouldn't she do Jungle Cruise? It makes the most sense. Mark? Yeah, I buy it too. It's nice to see a star as huge as The Rock, both literally and figuratively championing a female director mm-hmm. for one of his big upcoming projects. But this is less about DC versus Marvel and more about how the Fast and Furious movie are all about family because The Rock's in there <laughs> and Gal Gadot's in there briefly though she may be and she's in Wonder Woman Patty Jenkins directed it that's why he wants her to direct Jungle Cruise <laughs> I could I, I, I could care less about the movie I think it's great to see Patty Jenkins if she gets more work that's awesome yeah. I'm a fan of The Rock I do not care about this movie you could sign Steven Spielberg and Martin Scorsese and Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas to all do this movie together and I'd be like I don't care about the Jungle Cruise movie at all okay yeah. Mark Mark Mary Poppins, Jungle Cruise. Where, where oh, are they I on mean, your I list definitely care about the, the Jungle Cruise more than Mary Poppins. <laughs> I mean, look at the shirt I'm wearing, Dennis. I enjoy Jungle Cruises and safaris. Mary Poppins, too. I don't care about you. Make okay. me care. Oh. All right, what's next? It was at oh, the end okay. of... Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, I see what happens. <laughs> sorry, Perry. I get it. I no, get it. You know what? She spoke for, for Roka during the Jurassic Park thing. So, so. so I lost my turn. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we're, we're even now. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> How much do you care about Jungle Cruise? Yeah, how much do you care? Uh, on a scale of, you know, like gross ginger juices to <laughs> reading my Jurassic Park book to Jungle Cruise, like right in the middle? Yeah, right in the middle? Okay. Kind of. I don't know. I'll just like repeat everything that they said. Yeah, I'll wait until I see Wonder Woman and then I'll be excited about You're this. You're so upset about it. If, if you guys just walk around the office today and you see what we do to Perry, it's just we're just going to be whispering Benjamin Lockwood. <laughs> no, and I'm going to get so self-conscious about it. It really, it really bugged me at the table. And I'm like, oh, do I not know something about Jurassic Park? Yeah. If I bring, bring you my book, will you read it? No. <laughs> I was trying to be nice. He'll use it as a firewood. I know, probably. <laughs> wow. Hey, take this, Crichton. Not, not only can I not read, I don't have central heating or air either. So I live in a cabin. <laughs> Look at that shirt. It makes sense. Oh. All right, what's next? Perry's going to do mean things to all of you. Yeah. I still got that whoopee cushion. You better watch it. Oh, yeah. There you go. It was at the end of last year where we finally got a first look at the long-awaited Blade Runner sequel entitled Blade Runner 2049. The movie will pick up with Harrison Ford's Rick Deckard in the world of replicants 30 years after the events of Ridley Scott's 1982 classic. The first teaser didn't reveal much in the way of the story, but it did introduce us to Ryan Gosling's (laughs) new Blade Runner, LAPD (laughs) officer K. And if you want more from the movie, you won't have to wait long. In an interview with AP, Ridley Scott did confirm that a new trailer for Blade Runner 2049 will be attached to his upcoming Alien Covenant, which arrives in theaters on May 19th. Perry, by our cell, that the next trailer we get for Blade Runner 2049 will be the first full trailer for the movie. Good thing I get to go first, because I wanted to talk about this story. <laughs> um, I am not a big fan of Blade Runner. I know that a lot. I Ooh. No, I know. I know. And I want to be a big fan, because I know you guys, well, some of you at least here, are super hyped about it, and I've tried to watch it so many times, and I can't even force myself to like it. But when that teaser came out, I was really on the Blade Runner train all of a sudden. That teaser is great. I love Villeneuve, obviously. Deacons shooting this movie. I mean, go look at that teaser trailer. It's it's similar. It reminds me a lot about the uh, the Force Awakens and Last Jedi trailers, mm-hmm. where super short teaser trailers with a small handful of images that say so much. You don't get that much of the story, but just looking at those and the sound and the the music that goes along with it, it just seems like the perfect pairing. Where I see a little of Villeneuve's previous work in there, which makes me think that this might be a Blade Runner movie for me. So mm-hmm. I am dying to see Alien Covenant. Now I'm even more excited because I get to see the trailer for this before it. It was exactly like the Force Awakens teaser because Harrison Ford shows up at the end in the Blade Runner <laughs> 2049 <laughs> one too. Very fair point. I would buy this. 
this is for no other reason, just at the risk of making Roka's head explode. I've never seen Blade Runner. What the <laughs> hell is going on? I'm not a movie guy. I'd rather read a book. So I've uh, seen this uh, and hearing this kind of news. Look, Ridley Scott just has a new movie coming out every six months, and so he should attach trailers to his previous works. And I like this idea. I, look, you didn't need to sell me on another reason to go see Alien Covenant, but based on that first trailer that I saw for Blade Runner 2049, I'd like to see more from that film. And I don't know, maybe go back to 1982 and explore the first one. Do I watch the director's cut? Is that the one you want me to yes, see? Yes, okay. you watch the director's cut. I love cut. how the show is just like us shitting all over things we love. Roka. Yeah, well. Okay, so the question is, do I buy or sell the next trailer? Yes, absolutely, I buy it. I can't wait. I loved the teaser trailer. I hate that we have to wait till May 19th. I wish it would, somebody would leak it and just drop it already because I can't get enough of this. It's one of these rare movies that I could see every TV spot, every trailer, and it still won't ruin it for me. The joy I'm going to have watching this movie. I've been waiting for a sequel for this movie for so, so long, and they finally found the right person. And from what I saw in that teaser trailer, they found everything correct, including the, I think Gosselin's going to be great. The cast is interesting because Mackenzie Davis is a Essentially, probably the, this version of Daryl Hannah, Dave Batista is probably that version of the guy that's like, wake up, time to die. And so those kinds of <laughs> things are all there. So uh, to me, it seems like they're doing enough homages to the original, but still trying to separate themselves from it. So I'm excited to see it. Uh, my mind, I, it's like, it's everything within me not to tear the set apart and <laughs> set it on fire for people who haven't seen Blade Runner, because it is one of the, it is the greatest sci-fi movie ever made. You can come at me on Twitter if you want. I don't give a crap, because it is one of the, it is the greatest sci-fi film ever made. Is there are things that Scott Mance and I agree on. This is one of those things that we absolutely agree on. And so, to me, I'm excited about it. I just, I just wish it would come sooner than May 19th. But it's a perfect to put it on Alien Covenant. Totally yeah, makes sense. yeah, I'm gonna buy yeah. it as well. I mean, I think that what the first teaser trailer came out in December. I remember we yeah. were on our company trip in New York, and we we covered it then. I don't think yeah. we've really seen much since then. I think it's a perfect way to promote the film because yeah. people have to remember with with alien cut and the whole alien franchise that's a big franchise yeah. right blade runner you love it there's a big you know, movie fans who are you know hardcore into movies love it it's not really well known amongst the the casual movie going audience mm -hmm. either they've never heard of it or they've heard of it but they don't know much about blade right. runner but now if you have these commercials that have Harrison Ford, you have Ryan Gosling to connect to the younger audience, you know, the visuals, like Perry mentioned, with Roger Deakins shooting and Bill Newt directing, I think that will start to open up, like, a bigger fan base, and maybe people will go back and watch the original. But I, I think it's a it's a great marketing move for and them. You make a great point, Dennis, and I think it's because it's a noir. Yeah. And noirs haven't necessarily gotten massive public pop culture appeal. So, But it is a noir, so that kind of eliminates certain things. So, yeah. yeah. All right, let's move on to the last buy or sell. Wendy, what do we got? Variety is reporting that Captain America, the first Avenger director, Joe Johnston, will head up a new chapter in the Chronicles of Narnia series with the Silver Chair. TriStar Pictures will partner with the Mark Gordon Company, the, C the C.S. Lewis Company, and Entertainment One on the project, with Life of Pi screenwriter David McGee writing the script. While the previous installments follow the Pevensey children, this new chapter centers around their cousin Eustace Scrub, who travels to Narnia to save the kidnapped child of Prince Caspian. There is still no release date set at this time. Roka, buy or sell Joe Johnston directing Narnia The Silver Chair. This is interesting. Like, I buy this because I love Captain America, uh, the first Avenger. I think it's that's one of the sweetest, awesome superhero movies ever made. And so to me, I, I, I like this idea. But I'm a little worried. It's been seven years since the last one. I don't know why we're trying to restart the Narnia thing. And I'm a massive fan of the books. I used to read those over and over and over again for like five years. And so from about 10 years old till I was 15, just reading it over and over again in the summers, I loved the stories of Aslan and Narnia and the different generations that would happen, the different characters that would come up. Because if people don't know, Silver Chair is like decades later in Narnia, but only a year later in England. And Prince Caspian is out, King Caspian, and he's old and his son is missing. And Aslan employs used to scrub, who used to be a bully in the other, uh, in, in Treader. And with this girl, Jill, they go and try to find the prince. So it's, it's, an, it's a great story. Silver Chair is fantastic and you know people don't know these may not know these about these Narnia the Narnia books but they're they have a religious yeah. you know the religious underpinnings about it so to me it always it attracted me as well from that perspective so to me I like this combination I'm just worried that the public isn't really that excited to see another Narnia film because the last two films have been the law of diminishing returns in terms of quality and in terms of box office so yeah I'm gonna buy it as well I mean I wasn't actually I think a lot of people like the first yeah, one. Yeah, the first one. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought it was okay, yeah. but but I think if you're going to reboot this franchise, you start with one. Like I remember with the books, I, re I read them a long time mm. ago. 
everyone talked about uh, the first one, Chronic. Uh, right. Lion Witch and Wardrobe. Lion Witch and the Wardrobe. Right. And then they, they talked about Silver Chair right. as, as the, the two best books mm-hmm. out of the series. So if you're going to reboot this franchise, you might as well pick the one that's the most interesting. And you talked about it's at a later time. Now you can cast different actors yes. in the roles. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, else? Ah, uh, Dennis Roca. Uh, <laughs> books, um, man. Books. Look, I think the, I think Captain America: The First Avenger is a terrific, underrated movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe because you took something that really cur- could have turned cheesy very mm-hmm. quickly, and instead you made that one of the great characters in comic book movies today. I got to sell this overall, just from a business perspective, because. I don't understand what the market for this movie is going to be because, like Roka said, each Narnia movie had diminishing returns, and so now you're going to come back into theaters with Narnia the Silver Chair. Is that going to be the one? I think more people are familiar with the Australian band Silver Chair than they are <laughs> with Narnia the Silver Chair. So it doesn't look great on a poster. It's like, oh, they're still making these movies? I didn't know that was happening anymore. And what are you really going to use to sell this as far as the material goes? Oh, don't worry. don't Those other kids aren't in anymore. But here comes Cousin Eustace. <laughs> like, who's going to get excited about that? You know, you see, like, some kid, like, in the shadows, and he walks out. He's like, my name's Eustace. Scrub. <laughs> Eustace Scrub. Like, it, who cares? I, I, I don't see a big market for this. I wouldn't mind seeing the movie. I'm going to enjoy it. Religious underpinnings. Are you kidding me? Yeah. That line may as well turn water into wine. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, we got it. The line's Jesus. Okay. Uh, oh, very boy. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give this one the benefit of the doubt, and I'm going to buy it. I, I liked the first two Narnia movies. That last one was god-awful. And that's yeah. the one that introduced the uh, yeah. Eustace character, yeah, the Eustace too. Character, and yeah. Will, Will Poulter played him, right? Yes. And he, he was obnoxious and annoying, <laughs> which I get was the point of the character. Right. But that, in particular, did not make me think I want this Silver Chair movie, but if they're going to do this whole, you know, reboot thing where they they don't acknowledge any of the people that were cast in the first three movies and they move on like that, this is the book to do it with, so that mm-hmm. makes sense. And you know, we were talking about Star Trek, I think, on yesterday's show, where where we were talking about the production budget and the the actual amount of money that it makes and how that series still continues. And I was looking for a good example on something to compare it to. That's kind of this because this made worldwide at least the second two movies, a very similar amount to Star Trek. Mm. So, you know, I I feel like it is on the cusp of this could be something, there still could be something there, or it could be like a $150 million production budget mess. Mm. So I'm kind of curious to see how it pans out. I think the story elements are there. I'm not saying that the story isn't going to be intriguing, but I don't think it's going to do well. I can't can't envision a world, and again, I don't walk through a lot of paintings or hide in wardrobes, but I can't imagine a universe where this is going to make money because it's going to cost so much for the production budget. I I, I don't see how this recoups its expenses. Well, I mean, I think the trajectory of the franchise is going downward, right? Well, it made a ton no. of money in the it first went, one, and then... It went down. I It surprised yeah. me when I looked up the uh, the box office numbers how much that first one yeah. really made. Yeah. That first one made a ton of money, but another thing to consider when trying to predict box yeah. office for this next one is the first two movies were Disney movies. Yeah. We're in a little bit of a different situation when you pass this over to... Who, who has it now? Is it Sony? Sony? Yeah, but don't, guys, don't worry about this. Cousin Eustace is here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, and also you had James McAvoy, you had Tilda Swinton, you had a stronger cast in the first one, right? And that's why I think. And you it had made Liam more. Neeson as the Jesus yeah, Liam Neeson yeah. as, He was uh, born right. in a manger, exactly. I believe. <laughs> and in the second one, you have Eddie Izzard as Riva Cheap, so that's interesting. So you have more people involved, but then this third, that third one was. But like, I mean, even put it together. Like even a though there's a different studio, it's going to reboot different actors. That they're basically not going to acknowledge yeah. the other movies, right? But the audience is still going to yeah. remember. There, that's yeah. m- the, what hesitated for me to, to buy this thing. Is yeah. I think there's going to be a contingent of fans that are going to think of the quality of the last one and, and think that it's going to be reflected in this new one. Yeah, so. it's a tough thing because you're calling it Narnia, and we're yeah. so familiar with the Narnia movies. But you're not starting from scratch. You're start. You're you're picking up. This is this is a lot like Episode Four in New Hope, kicking off your franchise. Yeah. I just don't think this is going to work out as well as that one did. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. All right, guys, before we move on to Mailbag, I want to remind you that we're going to take your live Twitter questions at the end of the show. You can tweet us at Collider Video. Also, I want to remind you, a bunch of shows that are dropping on the YouTube channel today. We have Jedi Council that dropped yesterday. Um, we also have a brand new Schmodown between Jeff Schneider and Drew McWeeny that comes out two, today at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We also have Collider Mailbag on Saturday and Sunday. A behind the scenes uh, special one. Uh, yeah. About, uh, Perry, like why don't you e- talk about that? Every week is a special one. This week is our Schmodown one. You guys asked for it, and we said oh, we'd do man. it, and this, it's going to happen. And it's really good. And it features some of this guy here. 
who deserves a lot of credit. Stop it. Who deserves Aww. a lot of credit. Oh, it's adorable. No. Thank you. Yeah. Thank I mean you. it. I really do mean Thank it. You, yeah, last year, last week we had the Star Wars celebration behind the scenes. We've had yeah. a collider behind the scenes, and now the Schmodown one. <laughs> So <laughs> it is hard eating a hot dog on the convention floor when people are trying to take pictures with you. That's all I'm going to say. It's harder than Oh, you were hamming it up for the camera. No, <laughs> not Mark Riley. <laughs> that doesn't sound like my him last, at all. My last name's Ellis. <laughs> Riley's dad. If Ellis. I learned anything from Star Wars Celebration, it's that you should put barbecue sauce on your hot dogs. Oh, yeah. I, I did. It, it tasted quite, quite, quite good. See? Um, uh, we also have a brand new <laughs> awesome tack they're dropping today. That's with Jeremy Johns on the Go90 Network. And also, I want to remind you guys next week. Starting on Monday at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, we are going to do TV Talk daily, Monday through Friday, at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's going to be live, so look out for that. It's going to be one week only. We're going to test out to see how it does, see if you guys are interested in seeing TV Talk go daily. Mm. So if you guys are interested, check it out and like it, comment, and let us know what you think on Twitter. All right, what's uh, our first mailbag, Wendy? This one comes from Mr. Schmernermer, who writes, <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I love your show and listen every day, even streaming in the car to and from work. Quick question on the rumor about Apple eyeing a Disney buyout for around $200 billion. If this happens, could Netflix eventually lose the rights to their Marvel shows? Would Apple push for iTunes and Apple TV exclusivity, locking out Android and all other streaming platforms, or do you think they would play nice and reap the benefits from the current multi-platform model? I look forward to your opinions. Perry? Yeah. This is interesting. I remember when it came up while we were at Star Wars Celebration. Mm. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. Everything mm. that I've read about it seems to seems to point towards it being so incredibly unlikely. You that mean the buyout? You mean the buyout? Yeah, yeah, okay. the actual buyout. That there's just so many things that make it next to impossible that I've kind of leaned leaned away from trying to speculate on what that kind of merger could mean for content. So I really think it's going to wind up being a non-issue. I think the whole thing started from, you know, like two analysts out there making this prediction. And these kinds of predictions are made every once in a while. And yeah. I, I just, I don't think it's going to happen. I, I don't think it can happen for, for iTunes in particular, because iTunes' whole business model is about... You can get all the content you want right here. And the second they eliminate other things and just focus on Disney, that kind of implodes that. Yeah, I, I think it's unlikely that it would happen. But let's say half, hypothetically Apple does buy Disney and they bring them to the fold. It doesn't necessarily mean they will move over these Marvel Netflix shows to iTunes because it's such a different model. I mean, iTunes is is a place where people are buying these episodes, renting these episodes, where Netflix is a subscription model where mm. you're you're paying a monthly fee and then you get to watch as much as you want. And these these uh, Marvel Netflix shows are, are part of the kind of almost in a way a marketing tool to get you to subscribe to them. Mm. And at the end of the day, even a company like Apple, their sole purpose is to make money. And so if that is currently making Netflix or, or Marvel money, then they'll, they'll keep continuing to do that. It, it would be a bigger risk for them to like say, all right, we're not doing that anymore, mm -hmm. and we're going to bring it over to iTunes. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you guys think? I mean, look, if, if, you, if you take this that, okay, Apple is going to acquire Disney, then let's say Apple, they, they're not just satisfied with iTunes and Apple TV. They want to invent their own streaming service. Then that makes me put on my pre-law hat, and we have to talk about monopolies. So the way the government controls monopolies is they'll levy certain taxations against a conglomerate if they get too big. That is, if they let the free markets fight it out, and the free market does not able to put up a good enough fight against a huge corporation like Apple once they change their name to Skynet. Now, having said all that, I don't think that this is going to happen. If it does, I think Apple is going to sit back and allow these companies like Netflix and Hulu or whoever else to acquire their new product, Disney, and sell it to them. Now, Netflix may have to pay an exorbitant amount to keep Disney on their streaming service, which is probably going to be worth it for Netflix. So I think that you're going to have a happy medium in between. That is until Apple takes over the world. There you go. Roka. Shmurna murna mur. It's a great name. Do, 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 do. Shmurna murna mur. Look, this is what I'm saying. <laughs> to me, if Apple buys it, does. I really needed more bloopers. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was amazing. <laughs> that's, that's all I kept thinking the whole time we guys were talking. I just spit out everything do, I learned do, do, in college, do, do, do. and then you repeat them up at some Yeah, I know you had a Will Ferrell moment in old school. I know. Listen, this is the thing, this is the thing for me. Um, my belief is this: If Apple, you, you're going to tell me if Apple, the one that makes you buy extra chargers, that makes you buy wireless earpods whenever they feel like it, and new phones every year, and new iPads, new, is not going to do this? Of course they'll do this. They'll put it on their stream. They'll make you pay extra for it. That's that's. 
that's their business model. And but Dennis, you make a great point. If they want to stay in that business model, they can they they'll reap the benefits of the subscription to a degree. But I think this is true too. They'll buy it all and then resell it back to the subscription service at a higher rate, which is America. That's of course capitalism. That's how it works. So I think Apple would absolutely do this. But do I think the buyout's going to happen? So much would have to be like worked out. It would take such a long time that I don't think it would in the end happen. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. I'm more worried about the internet in general. If you follow Justine Bateman on Twitter, look out, everybody. I love that. I love that screenshot, by the way. That's, <laughs> is that a Ray or a classic? I, I think so. That That's is great. good stuff, Raymond. Yeah. All right, guys, now we're moving on to your live Twitter questions. You can tweet us at Collider Video. Uh, Wendy, what do we got picked out? This one comes from El Ronin, who writes, Hello, everyone. I'm a huge fan. Since Marvel announced they'll be at Comic-Con, what movies do you think they'll bring? Uh, yeah, we actually talked about this because mm. we're, we're planning our Comic-Con. We don't know, you know how many people we're bringing. We don't know what kind of stuff we're doing yet just because the schedule isn't out yet. But we were kind of trying to speculate what Marvel will bring. Definitely Thor Ragnarok, for sure. Yeah. The other ones that we're thinking they might do is uh, Black Panther and maybe a tease for Avengers Infinity War. Maybe mm -hmm. might might not even be footage. Maybe it'll just be concept art or something like that. What do you guys think? It sounds about right. Yeah, it sounds about right. That all hits the buttons. Um, Spider-Man will have come out by then, right? Yes, mm -hmm. Spider-Man yeah, so, will be yeah. out by yeah, then. That'll be pretty much it. They uh, might do like a bring the whole family type thing. So I feel like that's what they do every year mm. where, you know, even though a movie is so far down the line, they might usher Brie Larson on stage just to promote Captain oh, yeah, Marvel and uh, to keep that. And yeah. same thing with uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp. But yeah. after that Marvel open house that we went to a couple weeks back. No, no, no. The, you went to. Well, I did not oh. get to go to. <laughs> well, listen, I we're going to start doing that, Dennis. <laughs> you got to see Guardians after, I know. though. That's Thank something. Thank you, Perry. And we told you about it all. But the two things that, that stuck with me from I'm that glad my event. imagination is, is enough. <laughs> well, Ow. some, you know some people Lockwood. are bitter on this panel today. Yeah, he, I, uh, he's not a thing. I he's too not got a to thing. go to that press thing, and I saw eight pieces of concept art and had 38 chicken skewers. I think that <laughs> the Captain Marvel you're going to see is just Brie Larson coming on stage, but I do think that you're going to see maybe footage from Ant-Man and the Wasp because mm. they've started shooting that as of last week, I believe. So they're going to have something to show potentially. Same thing with Infinity War. They've already been scouting mm. locations, and they've, they've started shooting that too so i think you'll definitely see stuff from black panther like Perry and i got to see well that's the one black panther and yeah. uh what we saw from ragnarok too i want i just mm. want people to be able to see that i just i, I the story ragnarok cannot get here fast enough oh. and but it, what's going to be interesting to me is whether they bring anything that they did not show the previous week at d23 yeah mm -hmm. because yeah. because you know marvel's going to have a presence at d23 which is disney's expo which is the week prior to comic-con hard for me to imagine they're going to show something at d23 but then save something else just for Comic-Con. Maybe that's the case, but I think it's going to be similar presentations. I feel like what they're going to do is they'll show like a, a short trailer f at D23 and then an extended one at mm. Comic-Con. I mean, because D23 is a week before, we were, yeah. very, we were speculating that Marvel might not show up at Comic-Con. I'm glad that they are. I have a philosophy. I want everyone to be at Comic-Con because I feel like even with the great um, other conventions like... Star Wars Celebration or D23, and then hypothetically, if they were to create cons for different properties, I feel like Comic-Con is great because you can go there and see different things, because I'm not just a fan of one thing. I want to see multiple things, mm -hmm. so I'm glad that Marvel's coming. Well, we were talking a little on, I think it was Jedi, where where it was with the, the release dates and, you know, uh, Star Wars moving back to May, and it just made me think about the fact that uh, Disney also has all of those uh, live action adaptations, so that could be the place for D23, mm. and maybe they'll just save more for for Comic Con instead. Yeah, because one one seems very D23 appropriate with my limited knowledge of what that event is. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely they definitely focus a lot on on Pixar and their animated yeah. stuff and, and their live a action adaptations. I mean, Marvel is definitely going to be a big part. I don't, I don't know. Star Wars will be there, but I don't know exactly what they can There's do. rumors there's going to be some Han Solo oh, stuff really? at D23. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Yeah. Well, that would be uh, very interesting. It'd be pretty neat. Yeah. All right. What's next? Kylo writes, with the announcement of a new X-File TV series, do you think a new movie will happen? No. I doubt it. Yeah. I mean, it's the TV series had a decent... I think ratings, but I don't think it blew any, anything out of the water. I, I think that, that that time has passed. If you're going to make another X Files movie, just title it better. <laughs> then fight the future. Are you are you kidding me? <laughs> right now with that, fight the future. Just uh, uh, make a better name. 
I want to believe, isn't that the other one? That, yeah, I yeah, that no, one? yeah, that's right. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, yeah, it hurts I, my head. I don't think we're. I think TV is where it belongs now, and it should. It was always better on TV. I mean, the movies aren't bad, but they're just extended. They're extended episodes, you know. And so, to me, uh, I, it would make no sense to do an X Files movie. I don't think it would make any box office really. Yeah, yeah I think that ship has sailed. Yeah. yeah. All right, what's next? This one comes from Anod, who writes, What aspect of movies can drastically improve your perception of that movie? For me, it's the score. For example, Batman v Superman. Uh, for me, <laughs> it's the acting. I mean, even movies that maybe a, a lesser, maybe it's not as well directed, as well shot, but if the acting comes through, it, it draws me into what the story is, if I can empathize with the, with the characters. Mm -hmm. Ah, script. If you, if you have a good a good story and good characters, you can pretty much get away with ev with almost anything. I mean, obviously, if it's a shitty performance, the character's not going to come to life as well as you'd hope. But it definitely all starts with a good script. I, I agree with Dennis. There are movies that are terribly directed or with bad scripts, but the actors really step up to the plate and do great work with the limited amount of uh, uh, good lines that they have or good scenes that they're shot in. And I think that's important. I think... You know, if you want to go technical, editing is really almost the number yeah. one thing, to be honest with you. But acting is what keeps me in a movie. Same thing with comics. For me, the, with comics, it's like, if the art is good, I will stay with it if the story's not as great. But with film, acting is the thing. I would say sharks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, if there's sharks in movies, I'm, I, I tend to like them more than, than non-shark movies. Uh -huh. All right. So, uh, Wendy, what, what do you think about that? About uh, what not, not about Mark's shark thing. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> sharks make in 47 yeah. meters. There's a shark in 47 meters. It's gonna be a much better movie because there's sharks in it. The Shallows wasn't a great movie, but there were sharks in it. The Shallows was good. The Shallows was the shallows. not a good movie. I saw it on the really? way back from New York. I, didn't, oh, I wasn't I into it. I like. I, it too. I don't like Blake Lively. I, I liked her in that movie. Um, I think to me, really, is the acting. Hmm. Um, I feel like when the actors, no matter how cheesy or terrible a line may sound or seem on paper, if they can deliver it with um, motivation and feelings, then they can sell me on, on a seemingly bad script and a bad movie into a better, enjoyable movie. Yeah, acting, editing, 18-foot great white shark. Yeah, <laughs> I think you know what you're talking about. All right, let's do two more. Okay, this one is from Coffin Builder 89 who writes, Would you rather see Peter Jackson direct a Knights of the Old Republic trilogy or Christopher Nolan direct a Vader movie? Uh -huh. Oh, man. <laughs> I, I, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think I'd go, I'd, go with, I'd go with Peter Jackson in the Knights of the Old Republic one. Uh, Just because I'm very interested in Knights of the Old Republic. Also, I think Peter Jackson would be much more into it. I haven't really heard Chris Nolan express his love yeah. for the Star Wars franchise. Yeah. I, I actually, uh, I, I like both directors. I, I'm more of a Christopher Nolan fan, yeah. but I just think that he wouldn't be that interested in the Vader movie where Peter Jackson, I think he could engross himself into, into the Star Wars universe. Mm -hmm. I think I'm with you. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to see both things happen because they're great filmmakers and those are some great subjects there, but... I, I want to see a Knights of the Old Republic movie, or just really in any form, whether it's TV, comics. I want more yeah. of it. Well, he's already shown he can go and create an entire, you know, universe in mm -hmm. what he did in Middle Earth twice. So uh, why wouldn't he be able to go in and create something here with uh, Knights of the Old Republic? Absolutely, that's the thing. Is a great choice actually, and I would like to say Guillermo del Toro should do the Vader film. Mm. He's my new favorite director. He's <laughs> 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 doing the Darth Vader film. It's it's funny you bring him up and Perry. If you want to text him right now, I think. <laughs> I, I would actually rather see Del Toro do a do a Knights of the Old Republic movie Ooh. than Peter Jackson by by a slim margin because Peter Jackson is great at opening a world. So let's say he makes a Knights of the Old Republic film or a trilogy, and it's really good. It's not great, but it's really good. That still gives us a gateway to have that in canon now. So now I have all these other stories we can tell. Mm. I don't really want to see a Vader movie. I, I Darth Vader is my favorite villain of all time, and I think I'm good. I don't mm. want to see too much the thing I fear with these characters that we love a lot like Benjamin Lockwood or whatever is that we're going to introduce new stories and new th and it's like okay how much did Vader really do because there's all these books that he's done that are now canon and all this stuff Vader only has so many hours in a day before he has to go back to the back to tank and chill so I don't want him having too many things on his plate we've seen Darth Vader great appearance in Rogue One that's the way he should walk into the sunset all right last one Last one comes from Matthew Chandra, who writes, do you guys think at D23 we'll get another Star Wars trailer or sometime after or maybe even before? Have a great weekend. Uh, for Last Jedi, no. No, not at all. Mm. It's, it's too close a celebration. I mean, I'm interested in, you know, if Ellis is 
Speculating right about the whole Han Solo thing, seeing some footage from that, that'd be great. Well, I, I work in an office with Christian, so a lot of like, he just babbles a lot of stuff at the computer, and I can't tell if he's reading it yeah. or if it's his theories or whatever, but he's pretty good on that stuff. So I, I tend to agree that I think Han Solo is going to have some sort of thing at D23. You got to think there's going to be something with Last Jedi. Like, mm. it's weird to promote, that, hey, we have this movie coming out as Last Jedi, whatever. We're really excited about Han Solo. Like, they would do something for Last Jedi, even if it's not a new trailer, right. I wonder if they would show a behind the scenes thing. Because yeah. at Celebration, they showed pictures that Ryan Johnson took. He, he loves taking this camera that he's used on every mm. shoot, and he takes like boatloads of pictures, and he showed us some of those. And those were interesting to look at because they were actually a little gateway into, oh, that character standing next to that spaceship. Yeah. And it was kind of a cool insight into the making of the movie. So I think you might see a behind the scenes reel. This isn't going to give away anything major, but a la what they did last year's Celebration mm. with Rogue One, where you got a behind the scenes featurette instead of another trailer. I think the same thing could happen at D23. So if you have those tickets, don't scalp them just yet. Okay. Yeah, I'm be I'm actually really betting on that. I think it's going to be a behind the scenes type thing, and then we're going to get a trailer later on because even though Star Wars is the monster it is and is going to command attention no matter what's going on, it is D23 and Comic Con back to back, and I think they're probably going to wait until they can have every inch of the spotlight all to themselves mm -hmm. a little later. Yeah. That makes sense, like the correlation, because uh, yeah, it's Celebration D23 Comic Con. It's just a lot. Go rolling towards it and, and these ideas. So to me, and that makes sense with D23. I've been to D23 a couple of times, and that's what the, 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 to satisfy the fans, they'll give you that, or they'll bring out the cast, right? Or like what they did at Celebration, they had to come out, they had him coming out in like interesting, like she's all in red, he's in a star, he's in a stormtrooper jacket, Luke's all in black. Like there's little things that they, they give the fans that fans can go crazy about on the internet. So <laughs> that seems to be like what they'll do in D23. And it makes sense to do it with solo because D23 is kind of an offshoot of the main thing. And so it, it, it like, Celebration is the main trilogy. It would make sense to use that platform for Solo. They'll probably have like an hour about the new theme park too. Yeah, like, like that'll be great. Yeah. I, yeah. 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 To I, wanted, about that. I want to know everything about that theme park. Yeah. And let's not forget, so Disney, they have Star Wars, they have Marvel, they have animation and live yeah. action. And what else does Disney do really well? Nature movies. You know what animals live in nature? You guessed it. Disney's <laughs> shark. Oh my god. It'd be awesome. Right? You're you're like making a joke, but it's only a matter of time. Yeah, yeah it's gonna be They're hard running for out Disney. of animals. Like, yeah. like sharks are cuddly animals, so it's like when you see Disney's bears, it's like, oh, this bear is trying to find its mom in the wilderness. Like, it's gonna be hard to do that with sharks. Yeah. It's like like you're rooting against humans sometimes if you're rooting for like this shark is hungry and he's gonna go swim on a beach. <laughs> what bears aren't cuddly? Did you see Grizzly Man? Yeah, they're not cuddly. Well, not if you get they naked and live them for five years. It's a you know, there's a cutoff point. Visit bears for a week and then go back to civilization. <laughs> All right, guys, that's it for today's episode. I want to thank people joining us at the panel today. <laughs> Perry, where can people find you? I am on Twitter and Instagram at Pinemroff. Another reminder: watch Collider behind the scenes tomorrow. It's all about Schmodown, and I'm at the Overlook Film Festival all weekend this weekend. Ooh, so I'm going to post nice. updates on social and scary stuff. Hopefully, some good movies. We'll see. And you'll be talking about on the brand new Nightmares yeah. that's coming out. Uh, I can't next believe Wednesday. I didn't see it, say that. Yeah, we're going to do a whole segment on the Overlook Film Festival. There's going to be a secret screening that I've got high hopes is going to be you know one of the most anticipated horror movies of the year. So keep an eye out for that. Are you Thing at the Overlook Hotel. Where it's, it's it's the Timberline Lodge, the one that served as the exterior yeah. for Creepy. it. Creepy. Yeah. That's go, awesome. If you haven't, go on Instagram or Twitter, or whatever, and look at the hashtag for that. Apparently, there's snow all the way up to you know Ooh. mid level of that building, and it it looks. Super I bet creepy. they hire ghost bartenders and like creepy twins just walk around in the middle of the night. That's oh what God. I'm hoping for. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna show up at 2 a.m. at your looking like Jack Nicholson. Oh God. Is yeah. Danny in here? I really wouldn't be surprised. Here's Johnny. Yeah, and, and Roka's not talking about this weekend. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, Dennis. <laughs> uh, anyway, you can find me <laughs> at the Roka says on Twitter. And by the way, you've never hugged a bear in your life. Um, you can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at the Roka says. And we just dropped a new episode of the Cinephiles in honor of the 50th anniversary of the Graduate. We talked about it today on the Graduate. So go find that on iTunes and on Stitcher and on YouTube. And this Thursday, the Outlaw Nation podcast. Finally, first episode on the Schmoes No Plus Network. Subscribe to it. You'll listen to it. I'll have guests. It'll be. We'll talk about all things you're passionate about: movies, TV, politics, sports, pop culture stuff, gossip, whatever. We're covering it on the Outlaw Nation podcast. So please subscribe, and then we'll see what happens. Who's my favorite bear of all time? 
Brian Piccolo. You guys can find me on Twitter at Benjamin <laughs> underscore Lockwood. You guys can also find me at the Nerd Mouth Theater tonight in Hollywood. I'm going to be doing Joseph Scrimshaw's show where we argue for oh, yeah. blockbuster movies. Probably going to take Jaws tomorrow night at the World Famous Comedy Store. And where can people find you, Wendy? At the Movie Couple channel on YouTube and at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. And you guys can find me on Twitter at Think Here on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Thanks to Adam and the Cody in the back. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Collider Videos, and we'll see you guys next time. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.